Well, that video was so moving. You know, Jesus did some really important ministry at a well, and he's still doing it today. The blended efforts of the secular and the sacred in this example is so powerful and will make such an impact in the lives of so many people. It's been a, it's been a great weekend here at, uh, at New Hope, the ladies' breakfast Saturday morning, which I did not attend. Uh, the <laughs> and uh, Friday night, we had our seasoned saints meeting, and I certainly attended that. I qualify for that one. And uh, my wife is working with a wonderful committee. They're doing a great job. We had 126 seasoned saints there Friday night. We are taking over the world. <laughs> we are a force to be reckoned with, I'll tell you. And it's just been a, it's been a real delight to see uh, the response and responsiveness of people in that ministry. We really love getting together, and uh, we have a lot of fun. I mean, yes, at our age, you still can have fun, and we have a lot of it. Uh, now, when I met my wife, we've been married 51 years now, and when I met her, and no exaggeration at all in any of this, uh, she was this shy, very shy little girl from small town Iowa. She was so shy, I used to get mad at her. I used to tell her, I, you know, you've got, to, you've got to put yourself out there. You have to reach out to people. You, you have to, to learn to get past that, that shyness. And uh, I think maybe she's gotten there. Uh, <laughs> Friday night, we went out to eat. We were sitting at a table, it, and just the two of us, we were out to eat, just the two of us. It's always, most of the time, just the two of us. We, we don't have a dog. We don't have a cat. We don't have a goldfish. So it's kind of the two of us. And we're sitting there at the table, and, and I noticed that a table next to us, a large table, had been set up. And uh, so four or five guys came in to sit down at that table, and uh, you're talking about large. The smallest one in that group was probably at least 275 pounds. They were all muscled up. Their necks were bigger than their heads. Their shoulders were like mountains, telephones coming out of those mountains. I mean, uh, these were really, really big, young guys. But then the really big guys showed up, and there's about 16 to 18 of them sitting around this table. And, uh, you know, you, you quickly analyze what's going on here. One of them had a, a Drake football jersey on, so I, I knew this was the football team from Drake University sitting right next to us, mammoth guys. We got ready to leave, and as we were leaving, my shy little wife from small town Iowa walked over to those 16 to 18 massive football players. She put her hands on the shoulders of a couple of them, and she said, I take it you are on the synchronized swimming team. Their reaction was mixed, <laughs> but mine wasn't. I quickly retreated out the door. <laughs> You're on your own, baby. I mean, I watched a Bruce Lee movie one time, so I could probably have taken on four or five of them, <laughs> but not 18 of them, no way. So it's been fun. It's been fun to, to see this shy girl from Iowa now she recruits, she administrates, she delegates, and she harasses football teams. <laughs> life is interesting, and marriage, married life is really, really interesting, isn't it? Well, would you join me as I read one scripture, but I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we examine this scripture in its context. It's found in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Please take note, there's no S on the end of Revelation. It's not Revelations, uh, plural. It's one Revelation. It is the ultimate Revelation, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I'm reading from the New International Version, and it says in a very powerful announcement type of way, Here I am, exclamation mark. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus speaking. And three times in this chapter he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So listen carefully and closely. Listen with your heart, because it's possible to hear without really hearing. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is saying, give me your undivided attention. To whom is he speaking? Well, certainly the church, the Christian But beyond that, I believe any and every person who will hear him. And what does he say? Well, in our text, he says so much in so few words. And I see three very simple and all-important declarations here. The first one is, here I am. Now, in the King James Version, this verse is introduced Instead of with a phrase, it's introduced with a word, and that word is, Behold! I've already gone on record with my mourning over the loss of that word in our modern day speech. I feel like we lost something. It's a good word. And it's, in fact, found over 1,300 times in the King James Bible, but sadly only a half a dozen times in the New International Bible. I understand it's not a word commonly used today. It's dated English, but I still am reluctant to give it up. I feel like we lost a good word, a word that's really hard to place, replace. And it's really a, a word that contains a wake-up call, a bulletin, an alert. Take notice and take notes. An announcement of great importance is being made. An event, something out of the ordinary is about to happen. And you see that throughout the Scriptures. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Instead of the word behold, the NIV translates it, here I am, and it tries to capture the beholdness of the statement by adding an exclamation mark. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you threw that in. But I still miss the behold, because this is a behold kind of statement. Why? Because when Jesus says, here I am, something extraordinary has just been said, because this is the one who was not here. He wasn't anywhere. He was in a grave. He was dead. Now, if someone's at the door, there's a couple of things I want to know, and preferably as soon as possible, to alleviate any anxiety. First, I want to know, Who are you? That's right. Who's there? Are you friend or foe? Do you have good intentions or not so good? In other words, are you a bill collector? (laughs) So who is this one standing at the door? Well, that's what makes this so very exciting. He's already been introduced to us. Back in chapter 1, in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. In verse 17 of chapter 1, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, the King James Version, behold, I am alive forever and ever. 
So it's a big deal that Jesus is standing at the door. He's the one who died and overcame death. I am here because the grave could not hold me. I am here because I'm interested in you, so interested in you that I'm knocking on your door. He said, I stand at the door. That's right, your door, here and near, here and now, your door. You know, the Lord comes to every one of us one-on-one. -on -one. That's a marvel to me. There are millions of people in the kingdom of God. There are millions who have been truly born again. Millions who have met the living Lord and made Him the Lord of their lives. And to each one, one by one, He came and He announced Himself and He knocked on their door. The kingdom of God grows one person at a time. And Jesus knows each one by their name. He knows their address. He comes. He stands. He knocks. Behold. The image here is of a patient God. Patient. When patience has not been called for or deserved. Patient. When the one on the other side of that door has been all too rude and indifferent and resistant and hard-hearted. And yet he will not violate the will and he will not crash the party and he will not rip the door off its hinges. He stands at the door and he keeps on standing. He knocks at the door and he keeps on knocking. He waits at the door. And he keeps on waiting. The door of what? Well, certainly the door of a church, but not a building, but a people. In this particular case, the lukewarm, compromised church of Laodicea. But it's more than that. It's the door of any and every person. He stands at the door of your heart and my heart, and He announces His presence, and He asks to come in for a lifetime of fellowship and lordship. He stands, and He knocks. Can you hear Him? Or well, surely you have. Well, I know you've been busy with life. I know you've been distracted with other things and other people and other concerns and responsibilities and activities. But even at that, you've heard that knocking at the door. It comes, then it may get lost in the noise of the necessary. You may think you're too busy to answer the door. You may think you're too unworthy to answer it. You may be afraid to answer it, but he, he stands and he gently and patiently knocks. You see, there is love on the other side of that door. There is grace and truth and power on the other side of that door. Here I am. There's a second equally important declaration. Here I am and then open the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I often visualize that, visualize that as a way of making the transition out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, out of bondage into freedom, out of despair into hope. It's really that simple. Christ has made it that simple for the old and the young and the educated and the uneducated. Open the door. Just open the door of your life. Let him in. Specific targeted groups are indicated here. Open the door, you who are poor. Now, you may think you are rich and increased with goods. You may think you need nothing. Why, you may think that all is well, but my friend, without Christ, you are poor and naked. You are stripped bare. You have no money in your pocket. You don't even have a pocket. You have no currency to buy your way into heaven. Your appraisal may well be, I have need of nothing 
But the truth is, you have nothing. Do you remember George Beverly Shea? Some of you do. Others are saying, George who? He used to sing at the Billy Graham Crusades with that beautiful, rich, deep voice, with a knowing twinkle in his eye. He would sing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than riches untold. Nothing wrong with having wealth. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if that's all you've got, then you are the poorest of the poor. What do you have in your spiritual account? What do you have in your relationship with God? How rich is that? What do you have that will last beyond the few and fleeting years you've got on earth? What do you have when you stand before the living Lord? What do you have that will carry over into the next life? You say, well, this is all there is to it. This life, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and that's the end of it. No, not if there's a God. Not if he had anything to do with the creation of man. Not if the Bible has any credibility. And not if Jesus knew what he was talking about. Open the door, you poor in spirit, and he will make you rich for eternity. Open the door and Christ will come in. And when you have Christ, you have everything. In verse 18, I counsel you, he says, to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. I had a funeral yesterday, and uh, I didn't know the gentleman. I was able to pick up bits and pieces of his life, and I saw what his interests and his passions were. And his son told me, he said, Dad had lots of friends in lots of places. And sure enough, a lot of friends show overflowing crowd there for the funeral. But I didn't know if he had the friendship of Jesus to take him into the next life. He loved motorcycles. He had toys to play with. And he had a wonderful array of goods in life. But, but I don't know if he had treasure to take out of this life and into the next. Open the door. You who are spiritually poor, and He will make you rich. Open the door, you who are naked. In verse 18, He will clothe you with white clothes. And white is symbolic of purity. He will clothe you in white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. You see, without Jesus, we have no white clothes. We have no access to white clothes. We can only wear filthy rags. But he stands at the door and knocks, and if, if we will invite him in, he will clothe us in his garments of white. And that's the way we will stand before God for eternity. Open the door, you who are poor. Open the door, you who are naked. Open the door, you who are blind. And who are these poor and these naked and blind people? All who are without Christ. You, me, without Christ. And those who refuse to open the door and those who keep Christ on the outside think they are rich, but they are poor. Think they are clothed, but they are naked. Think they can see, but they are blind. Like it or not, approve of it or not, there's only one cure for spiritual poverty, and that's His riches his gold. There's only one cure for spiritual nakedness. That's his garments of white. Only one cure for spiritual blindness in verse 18, his salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Here I am. Open the door. Then thirdly, eat with me. Verse 20, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. King James Bible says, I, and will sup with him and, and he with me. Other versions translated, fellowship with him. Sup, eat, fellowship. They all carry the meaning of his ongoing, ever-deepening relationship 
with us and ours with him. Now earlier I mentioned if someone shows up at my door, I want to know two things. The first one is, who are you? And the second one is, what do you want? The truth is, I can't remember the last time somebody knocked on my door and wanted to do anything for me. They wanted to sell me some service or a product, or they wanted me to contribute to some cause, or they wanted to convert me to their religion, or they wanted me to endorse their candidate. And that's what happens so often when there's a knock at the door. And some people have become so, uh, felt so hustled and hassled by solicitors that, well, they never answer their door or their cell phones. Somebody said, we're living in a day when everybody has a phone and nobody answers it. (laughs) I got a call the other day. I didn't answer it. I guess I figure if it's important, they'll leave me a message. Well, they did. They left me a message. It was a funeral home wanting to know if I could come and preach a funeral. When I called back the funeral director, I said, I didn't answer your call because I thought you were probably wanting to offer me an extended warranty on my vehicle. (laughs) He said, yeah, I've been getting those calls too. Pastors and funeral directors apparently drive older cars. But listen, every once in a while, it's a wise thing to answer the door. Some of you, not very many of you now, but some of you in my age bracket, you would remember that old black and white television program called The Millionaire. God would go out and give, give away a million dollars. You want to answer the door when he's out there. Yeah, once in a while, it's a good move to answer the door and let the caller in. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, the wisest move any of us could make is to let Jesus in, is to welcome him into our hearts and our homes. I really enjoy reading those episodes when Jesus was eating and dining with people in the New Testament. There's no record of him ever turning down an invitation to anyone who was willing to open their door and invite him in. And his humanity really comes through. I can hear him laughing, sharing life, earning his reputation as the friend of sinners. I can see the repercussions of that dining experience, I can see people's lives changed and the chain reaction of other lives being changed because Jesus sat at the table with them. Here I am. Open the door. What does he want? I want to come in and eat with you and you with me. Open the door. You can't imagine what awaits you. You can't imagine what you've been missing. There's a depth and dimension of fellowship there just waiting for you and and me to hear his voice and open the door. You open the door and you get the table. The very symbol of hospitality and fellowship and friendship. Now, most of you, I'm sure, have seen that beautiful allegorical painting of William Holman Hunt, a picture of Jesus standing at the door. There are several versions of that, and he himself did more than one, but all of them have some things in common. But uh, the one I'm thinking about, Jesus is standing at this beautiful door. It's nighttime, and the weeds and the vines have overgrown the door because the door hasn't been open for a long, long time. Jesus carries a lantern in his left hand, speaking to the fact that he is the light of the world. 
Well, the critics of the painting suggested to William Holman Hunt that he had forgotten something in that painting, that there was no handle on that outside of that door. And Hunt explained that it was all quite intentional. He said, the door in the painting has no handle and can therefore be open only from the inside. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Will you open that door today? Father, I, I thank you today that we have a God who so loved this world that he sent his only begotten son. And his son shows up so faithfully, gently and lovingly and patiently knocks at the door, when he could have ripped the door down, when he could have kicked it off its hinges, when he could have forced himself upon us. But we know that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a reciprocal love, loving hearts that receive him, love him, serve him out of a joyful submission. So, Father, as we take these moments, help us to rightfully reflect. Help us to carefully listen. Help us to obediently respond to the one who stands at the door of our hearts and who knocks. And without fail and without exception, may every one of us be overwhelmingly inclined by grace to open that door and to acknowledge who is there and to receive him in the fullness of his right, his authority, his lordship. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.